Hello to all. It's today a great pleasure to present to you SK Ramers. He's a really good friend for Nitro Police. He's a past uh, vice president of the Educational Activities Board in Nitro Police. And he will bring today a, a lot of uh, inspiration things as a leadership in, in, the, in the presentation. I will bring you the, the floor to Pedro Plaza to present him, and later he will do the, the speak today. Thank you to all the people attending, and it's a pleasure from the Tripoli uh, UNED uh, student branch, and of course the Tripoli chapter of the Education Society, Spain section, and all the people that supported Pedro Plaza and so on there. Thank you very much, and the floor is yours, Pedro. Thanks a lot, Manuel. Yeah. Eski Rames uh, is a renowned engineering educator with over three decades of leadership experience as a dean, department chair, and faculty member in the California State University system. The programs uh, he established serve industry practitioners in high weight, high demand fields, including renewable energy, assistive technology, and advanced manufacturing. As 2016, uh, 2017, Vice President of Educational Activities, he championed collaboration, diversity, and inclusive excellence through innovative programs like the IEEE Learning Network, ILN. Rames is an IEEE Fellow recognized for contribution to entrepreneurship in engineering education and founding director of TSU Northrights International Recognized AIMS Program that uh, mentors and supports Latino and Latina students and underrepresented uh, minorities in engineering. His many recognitions include the young uh, Guerrera Engineering Educator of the Year, William Johnson International Award for Leadership and Contributions to the Profession and the IEEE Region 6 Community Service Award. Rames has served on the boards of IEEE and AVET leading volunteers and staff with shared strategic goals, measured outcomes, and transparent fiscal leadership. And now I give you the floor, Rames. Thanks a lot for uh, sharing with us uh, this, this session and this interesting uh, content. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, uh, Pedro, for that gracious introduction. And uh, my dear friend, uh, Professor Manuel Castro, for your kind invitation uh, to speak to the UNED student branch and to all of our colleagues in Region 8 and Europe and anywhere in the world. Uh, a good evening to you if you're in Europe. Good morning if you're in California. Uh, again, uh, we are witnessing some unprecedented challenges in the world today uh, with COVID-19. But one of the things that remains constant despite all the challenges are organizations like IEEE. So when we think about IEEE, our members uh, are spread all over the world. And at this point in time, even this webinar is a great example of how IEEE members are creating the technologies that allow all of us to work. Or more importantly, if you're a doctor or an emergency line frontline worker, we have the opportunity to use telehealth to help individuals wherever they live without putting ourselves in harm's way. So IEEE, again, has a tremendous role to play. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Uh, I'm going to share a couple of stories as part of my presentation. The title of my presentation uh, is called Engineering with Inspiration. In other words, when we think about innovation, uh, I want people to think about engineering. And the way I look at that equation is that the right-hand side of the equation is engineering with inspiration. When you put the two together, you get innovation the IEEE way. So here is uh, some of the things that I want to talk to you about. Uh, I want to give you just a brief background of um, uh, my interests, uh, how I got engaged with IEEE. Then we'll focus quite a bit on the educational resources that are available through IEEE. Uh, if you can uh, see me on the video screen, along with the PowerPoint, uh, interesting thing is I'm wearing a T-shirt today that was actually presented to me when I was a student branch counselor 
that was almost 30 years ago. So the good news is the T-shirt still fits me. Uh, and I'm, I'm able to still use that. Uh, but these are the relationships that IEEE provides, and we'll talk about that. We'll also describe IEEE's humanitarian activities, namely EPICS and IEEE, IEEE Smart Village. And then I want to speak to you because in the student branch, many of you are probably going to be graduating this year. Some of you may be going on to graduate school. What are the opportunities that IEEE can provide to you uh, as a volunteer leader? And how can you develop yourself professionally, technically, uh, to, to serve the community? So those are some of the ideas that I had that I'll be sharing with you today. So again, without much ado, that's who I am, Ramesh. The program that I lead, that Pedro mentioned, it's called AIM Squared. And it stands for Attract, Inspire, Mentor, and Support Students. And as you probably know, uh, in uh, California, uh, we have a large population of uh, Latina Latino students. Now, even though the population is very large, when you look at fields like engineering, when you look at fields like STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, you do not find too many students who are Latino Latina. So they're considered to be an underrepresented minority in our state. So we work very hard to attract these students to the STEM fields, both to support them as well as to ensure that we can uh, so, uh, create you know, future engineers and uh, meet the future needs, the workforce needs of our state. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, where I am. And by, by way of background, again, you, you heard a little bit about me, so I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, I've been in IEEE for almost 40 years, right? Uh, 38 years to be precise. And one of the things that really stands out to me are the uh, relationships, the communities, the collaboration that existed. All the way from the time I started, I was the uh, one of the founding members of my student branch, uh, probably other than Manuel, most of you were not born at that time in 1978 uh, back in India. And that's what led my path to IEEE. That's what led me to go to graduate school. And I became an active member, and my field was in optical communications. So like many of you, I started writing papers, I did research, uh, I was working in the lab. So that was my introduction to IEEE. I really did not know that you had all these other opportunities within IEEE. And that happened as I started to volunteer for different positions in the section, in the chapter, and then eventually got to serve on the IEEE Board of Directors. So one of the messages that I want to leave with you on this slide is that every one of you listening on this call, if you're an IEEE member, if you're a student member, consider volunteering because the best way for you to learn is to actually volunteer and serve your community. And as you volunteer, you become more enabled and IEEE opens more doors for you. You get more opportunities to serve. Yes, we have a seven day week, 24 hours a day, but you'll find the time, you will make the time to serve the community. So I want to leave that message with you today uh, as far as who I am. So tell you a little bit about uh, California. So uh, I work in a system called the California State University System or the CSU. So this system is a public university system, meaning that the state of California supports it. Uh, it is also one of the largest public university systems. In fact, I believe it is the largest. Uh, the second largest is in New York. So in California, we have 23 campuses, and as you can see, almost half a million students, and roughly 10% of those students are in graduate programs. Every year, we graduate about 100,000 students. Uh, my campus, uh, if you can look at the map of California right here, my campus is Northridge, which is here in Southern California, and this is the largest campus. It has almost 40,000 students. Now, within the campus, uh, we have a number of different colleges, engineering, computer science being one of them. Uh, we have business, we have arts, we have uh, liberal studies, we have humanities, uh, we have communications, we have health, and so on. One of the things that really stands out, and as I think about today's talk, innovation in action, is what we do in engineering. And I'm sure you've all heard the story, uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And I said, well, how can I multiply that effect? So I put a lot of pictures 
on the slide. And I figured that the more pictures I put on the slide, the more you can see how engineering students and faculty uh, continue to work on projects, hands-on projects. Most of these pictures are from what we call our senior design project showcase. So every year we have a capstone design project at all disciplines, whether you're in civil, electrical, mechanical, computer engineering, computer science, manufacturing, um, and so forth. All of the students have to complete a capstone senior design project. And the program we created is called a showcase where the students actually come and demonstrate the projects that they work on to the public. So anybody in the community and the Northridge community can come and see these projects. For example, we have projects like the unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, we have projects like the uh, human powered vehicle. Uh, we have the uh, formula car project that the mechanical engineers produce. Uh, we have these satellite communication projects where students actually create a CubeSight satellite that flies. Uh, it's a NASA based project. And then we have the concrete canoe and the steel bridge. So these are wonderful projects. But the real interesting thing is that all of these projects have some application in the community. And we're able to share these projects with the community. So in addition to what the students are learning in the classroom, they also get an opportunity to practice their presentation skills, to present what it is they're doing so that people outside can understand what engineering is all about. Well, let's think about engineering. So when you're an engineer, I think the first question you ask yourself is how can we do it? By the way, the, the photo that you see on the top of the screen, that is our university library. And you know we live in Southern California and so Hollywood is very big right here. If anybody here is a fan of Star Trek, Starfleet Academy, you might remember the opening scene in Starfleet Academy. This is actually the, the opening scene in Starfleet Academy where people are coming down the stairs. The only difference is with artificial intelligence and virtual reality, this whole lawn that you see here was converted into an ocean. So sometimes when I recruit students, they come to the university and they ask me, Dr. Ramesh, where is the beach? And I have to tell them, put on your virtual reality glasses and imagine there is a beach. But back to my question. Engineering, we ask, how can we do it, right? That is the first question. Then we start thinking about the design. So if you're building a circuit, if you're building a car, if you're building an unmanned aerial plane, what kind of materials do you use? Uh, what are the constraints? Uh, what are the attributes that work the best? So these are the questions that we ask as a design engineer. And then the third most important thing is innovation. The innovation question is, will it make an impact? For example, right now, the whole world has turned into a virtual modality because face-to-face -face meetings, face-to-face -face instruction is just too risky due to COVID-19. So we've all adapted, we've changed to a virtual reality. But let's think maybe a year into the future, one and a half years into the future, when we develop a vaccine, when we come out of this crisis, at that time, people are going to ask the question, why do we have to do things the same way as we did before? In other words, uh, they say necessity is the mother of invention and innovation. We really have to be thinking about how we can innovate to better serve our community. So again, the three questions, engineering is how can we do it? Design, we talk about what attributes work best. And innovation, innovation in action, I'm going to give you some examples how this actually inspires us to make a difference. So let's get in a little bit deeper and start thinking about engineering. So as you're studying electrical engineering or computer engineering, uh, you may be a communications engineer, you may be a power engineer, you may be uh, 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 you know, circuit designer. Uh, before you design a very complex system, you start with the small building blocks. You start with the power conditioner, you start with the uh, modulator, you start with the demodulator, you build these very slowly uh, and you test this, you really test this to make sure that everything is working. So we've called this process predictive design and the idea is that in systems engineering you want to minimize the possibility that things are going to fail, right? So in design, once you've got the engineering blocks together and design, you have to make some choices. How do we integrate? For example, 
on Saturday, I was speaking to the IEEE Smart Village Group. The IEEE Smart Village Group, as you might know, is very interested in providing electricity. There is about 1.6 billion people on the planet that don't have access to electricity. Many of them don't have access to the grid. So they're thinking about distributed ways of providing power uh, to these individuals where they live. So perhaps you're using renewable sources. You might be using photovoltaics. You might be using hydro. You might be using um, wind. You might be using uh, uh, you know, human-powered vehicles. You might be uh, taking the exercise equipment, the swings and the seesaw sets and things that children play on, somehow com convert that energy into something that can be stored as electrical energy. Now, when you think about it as a design engineer, how do you integrate all of these technologies so that you can make a coherent system that works reliably? So you have to test this, right? So as engineers, we model, we test, we build, and then we go back to the drawing board again, and we model, we test, and we build. And ultimately, we answer the question and say, is there an impact? So the impact in the example that I just gave you is providing power to people that do not have access to electricity. We take things for granted, right? You and I right now are using laptops, we're using our cell phones, we're talking to each other, we're doing these webinars online, but imagine there are people in the world that do not have access to electricity. In other words, they simply cannot turn on a switch and assume that light will be there. That's what innovation does, right? Innovation provides the disruptive opportunity to really make a difference. So I gave you one example. I'm going to share two stories to you which really brings out the inspiration. In other words, being an engineer, IEEE's mission is advancing technology for humanity. How can we actually make a difference for humanity? So I'm going to share two stories with you. And before I do that, I want to share uh, four publications, right? So the two publications on the left, one is called The World is Flat, and the other one is called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. Uh, both of these are written by Tom Friedman, uh, and The World is Flat has actually been written quite some time ago. I want to say about at least 12 years ago. And what Tom was talking about at that time was how the technologies, namely the internet uh, and the global connections that we have, was making it such that you could be in UNED in Spain, I can be in California and Los Angeles, and we can be connected and we can be working together. Or you could have virtual teams that are distributed around the world. You could have a surgeon who was in New York who was operating on a patient who was in France using a robot. All of these things are possible using the technology. On the right-hand side, the book that he wrote a few years later is called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. And this speaks about energy in particular because it says that fossil fuels and energy are running out very rapidly. And what are we going to do in order to ensure that we have a sustainable world, a planet that all of us can uh, provide to our children, our grandchildren, so that they can live comfortably and peacefully. So a few years ago, we are already here in 2020, the United States National Academy of Engineering produced two publications. One is called The Engineer of 2020, and the other one is called Educating the Engineer of 2020. So if you go download both of these, if you go to the National Academy of Engineering site, you can download these for free, both of these books, The Engineer of 2020 and Educating the Engineer of 2020. There are some really interesting concepts there. It talks about how engineers need to be analytical, how they need to be problem solvers, how they need to understand different cultures, be collaborative, be inclusive, and ultimately, they need to be looking at ways to address the problems that are confronting humanity. In some communities, it could be electricity. In other communities, it could be healthcare. In another community, it could be transportation, or it could be clean water. But whatever the challenge is, the engineer of 2020 needs to be thinking broadly beyond their own personal discipline on how they're going to serve humanity and how they're going to work. In other words, engineering programs need to be outward focused and entrepreneurial engines of innovation. Again, you see that word innovation, right? There was another book that came out and I, have, I don't have it on my slides, but it's called Changing the Conversation. And in Changing the Conversation, the National Academy of Engineering that says no profession excites humanity like engineering. In other words, no profession 
has such a direct and positive impact on our lives. Engineers and scientists uh, are making contributions that truly make a difference in the lives of people, right? So having said that, let's move on to my story. So I'm going to ask the question, uh, have you heard of this company? It's called Not Impossible, right? So Not Impossible is a company that is based here in Southern California, uh, in uh, Santa Monica. And the story I'm about to share with you is the story of Tony Kwan. Uh, Tony Kwan, uh, his uh, uh, name on the street is Tempt One. He's a graffiti artist. And uh, not impossible, just like the name sounds, if somebody comes and tells them, you know, there is no way you can do this, they bring together uh, in a crowdsourced manner a group of people from different professions, whether they're engineers, scientists, uh, doctors, and they're trying to figure out a way to make whatever is not impossible possible, right? That is his story. So the story of Tony Kwan is that he was afflicted with a disease called ALS, right? So ALS uh, is a disease in which his muscle cells are gradually dying and he's completely paralyzed. He's not able to move. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he needs a ventilator in order to breathe. Uh, the only thing that he can do uh, is to blink his eyes. That's about the only thing that he can do. And remember, this is a young man. When this happened to him, he was only about 21 years old. Uh, he was a painter. And he was probably one of the best artists that we had. He used Gothic art and um, uh, had some really wonderful, wonderful graffiti. So what Not Impossible said is, how can we, in a way, give his life back to him? Because his whole life revolved around painting. What can we do to do it? Now, if you think about the way he communicated, you see him in the hospital bed right here. If he needed food and so on, somebody would come and stand in front of him and they had a uh, little keyboard kind of uh, sheet and they would touch the letters and he would blink when they touched the letters to indicate how to communicate. That is a very, very slow way to communicate. What they uh, thought they could do is they said, if he can communicate that way, is there a way for him to use his eyes? In other words, just blink his eyes and paint, right? Pretty remarkable. So what they developed is called an eye writer so we'll, we'll see a sh small video so you can see exactly how this worked. So the eye rider consists of really a very inexpensive pair of sunglasses. Uh, they used from infrared LEDs. Uh, they took some open source software, freely available computers. So this whole project, this whole device that you see here was built with off the shelf components for less than $50, less than $50. And with that, Tony Kwan was able to paint again, right? So I'm going to play a short video here for you, and then we'll pick it up from there. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Uh, 
That's why it's night when we're out in downtown Los Angeles. Up there in the tall building. Unbelievable. It's done. Someone was telling me just me up there. That was actually Tony Floyd. The hospital. A mile away. Projected onto the wall of the building. The guy in the delegation team complained. inspiring so when you think about what the technology did for tony and tony says he felt like he was being held underwater without being able to breathe and then all of a sudden when this technology was developed by a group of engineers by a group of people who really just came together and said let's make it possible uh now he's able to paint with his eyes that to me is inspiration so when you combine inspiration in that fashion with engineering look at all the engineering that it took to make that happen that is innovation because you made a difference in somebody's life here's another example that i want to give you closer to home uh, we have like many universities we have uh, introductory computer programming course uh, we use java uh, programming uh, that's what we use and we noticed that a lot of students were having difficulty in the java programming course uh, they were not uh, really doing well. And so the faculty, there are three faculty that you see on the screen here, Ani Nahapetian, who taught the course, uh, Professor Gloria Malara, who is another faculty member who taught it, and Rick Alviso. Rick is actually with the Department of Music. Uh, Gloria and uh, Ani are with the Department of Computer Science. So they had this brilliant idea that said, is there a way for us to teach computer programming by using music as a vehicle. In other words, if you're teaching programming and you're teaching somebody the concept of an array, a filter, a loop, and uh, various uh, concepts in structured programming, it turns out that there is a very close correlation with music. And is there a way for us to connect the examples from music to programming? So that's how they did it. I wanted to give you the website here so that you can, you can access it. Uh, ecs.cson.edu slash tides. And then if you click on modules right here, uh, it will take you to a page like this. So you can actually see the modules. So for example, here, uh, you have this uh, uh, module called World Music. And this illustrates the principles of loops and arrays. So guess the genre. So it gives you different music, world music, whether it could be from Spain, it could be from India, it could be from... Uh, America, and then depending on how you guess it. in other words, you're learning programming, and at the same time, you're connecting it to your knowledge of music. Same thing here with Guess the Flag. So please feel free to use this. These are freely available to you. Uh, each of these has uh, the demonstration. It has the skeleton code. You also have a small video, and it has some notes. So anybody anywhere in the world can freely use it. Again, this to me is an example of engineering, combining engineering with inspiration. You know, the story that I told you about Tony Kwan. So at Northridge, we created a program called assistive technology engineering. So we actually have a master's degree 
in ATE, where we bring students together from all different disciplines to work together to create products and processes to help people with disabilities. Okay, let's move on to IEEE and talk about how all of this can be possible because of your connection to IEEE. Clearly you've seen that IEEE benefits humanity, we foster technological innovation. Now, when you look at our mission and vision, and one of the things that really jumps out to me, this is our strategic plan. We have five principles in our strategic plan. These are the five principles on the right. One of them is that we drive global innovation through collaboration. We are doing it right now. We enhance the public understanding of engineering and technology and pursue standards for their practical application. Right now, around the world, and I know including Spain, there are a number of people working to develop ventilators because there's a shortage of ventilators. Within IEEE, we're talking about what are the standards that need to go into them because we want to make sure that the doctors and the hospitals that use them can be assured of their quality. We want to be a trusted source of educational services. IEEE, again, provides these opportunities. This one is the one that is very important to you as a student. Provide opportunities for career and professional development. So always, please keep IEEE uh, as your trusted resource. And then we want to inspire a worldwide audience by building these communities, whether you're technically interested, you want to make a project to benefit humanity, or you just want to inform public policy. Now, the key thing, ladies and gentlemen, in these values are the ones that you see on the left. Trust, service to humanity, integrity, global community building, partnership, growth, and nurturing. So truly think about the IEEE strategic plan as something that is down to earth, something that you can practice, something where you can combine engineering with inspiration for future innovation. Okay. So I told you I started as an IEEE member, and honestly, I had no idea that all of this existed. So IEEE is built on a number of different boards. So we have a board for publications, one for education, one for standards. We have IEEE USA. You are all part of the UNED uh, student branch. UNED student branch belongs to a section in Spain. The section reports to a region, which is region eight, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And that region is part of what is known as MGA, Membership and Geographic Activities Board. Depending on your interests, my interests are photonics and education. That's how I met Professor Castro and uh, Professor Tawar and other friends. Uh, that is one of the societies and technical activities. So you can be a member and you belong to the United Student Branch. You could also be interested in photonics like I am and be a member of a technical society. So this is a large, large ocean and you literally have to find your way through this, right? So what I thought I'd focus on is this box in yellow, which is educational activities, because that I think is very important to you from your professional development. So IEEE educational programs and resources. The um, programs and resources that you have, incidentally, that link there uh, has changed. Uh, I'd updated it on a different presentation, but please make sure that you get the, uh, the, the correct link. That is not the, the correct link. Okay? Uh, it'll probably be there on the next slide. We have uh, support for pre-university programs, university programs. Uh, we have a teacher in service program, service learning, and continuing education. Now, where can you find it? This is the correct link right here, right? Uh, ea.ieee.org. And if you go to the main IEEE page, this is the main IEEE page. If you click on it, uh, just click on education, and that will take you to this next page, okay? IEEE Educational Activities. Now, most of these resources will require you to sign in with your IEEE account. For example, what you see here is a try engineering screen. So if you're working with a local community, with a high school, with a college, and you want to get a set of lessons, we have a toolkit that is out there for you. We have other resources. So sign in with your IEEE account, and then you should be able to access it. So I'll go back one screen so you can see the website again. So go to the main IEEE page, IEEE.org, click on education, which is ea.ieee.org, and then sign in with your IEEE account to access educational activities, okay? So if you go to Try Engineering, for example, so I just pulled up uh, the portal. So I'm one of the people that are featured in Try Engineering. You have resources for teachers, you have resources for students, 
Uh, if you're a student looking for graduate school, you have a list of universities here that talks about the program. It's a really wonderful resource. You can also hear from other students. You can hear from other professionals. So please check it out. It's completely free, no pop-ups. You can use it. IEEE Eta Kappa Nu. This is our honor society for electrical engineering. And Professor Castro was just telling me at the start of this call that uh, IEEE Eta Kappa Nu is now going to establish two chapters one at UNED and the other one at uh, UPRM. Really, really thrilled. This is wonderful news. So Ada Kappa Nu is the Honor Society for Electrical Engineering. It was founded in 1904. And in 2010, Ada Kappa Nu merged with IEEE. So we offer a number of resources. Now, many of you belong to the student branch. This being an honor society, you have to be invited to participate. And typically, people who are invited have high academics, they have high scholarship, but most importantly, they serve the community. So there are three principles, scholarship, character, and attitude. We also have a student leadership conference that brings together IEEE Eric members from all over the world to help support them in their professional and technical development. The reason I put this up for you are the services that you can get, networking, mentoring, community service, awards and recognitions, if you look at the leaders in IEEE today, the people who invented the microprocessor, uh, the person who invented the internet. In November 2019, I was at the Boston Board of Directors uh, meeting, and we had a uh, EAB award ceremony. We recognized Dr. Bob Metcalf as one of the eminent members of IEEE. And Dr. Metcalf gets up on stage and says, I guess I'm being recognized because I invented the internet. He started, remember, as a student member of IEEE Ada Kappa Nu. So Ada Kappa Nu provides tremendous leadership opportunities for all student members. Another program I want to describe to you is EPICS. EPICS stands for Engineering Projects and Community Service, and it really connects what you learn in the classroom to a community need. So there are four areas in which EPICS operates. One is called Access and Abilities. So it is to help people uh, both improving access as well as helping people that may have some challenge, either physical or uh, other challenge, as you saw with Tony Kwan. Education and outreach. We have projects that focus on the environment, energy and environment, and then human services, just connecting engineering to the community needs. Anybody in the world in an IEEE student branch can apply for an EPICS project. So how does it work? So if in the UNED student branch, let's say you want to create an EPICS project, you want to find an NPO, that is a nonprofit organization in your community, to see what needs are and how you can go about helping them. At the same time, one of the goals of EPICS is to connect university students to study engineering. So connect with the high school, connect with the middle school, connect with students who are interested in engineering. So that's what EPICS does. So at the base of the pyramid, we have students like you, and pre-university students, we have nonprofit organizations in the community that benefit from EPICS. So how can you do this? The website is epics.ieee.org. Now, there's a few things that you want to think about. You need to address how you can talk about EPICS IEEE theme, namely the four themes, access and abilities, energy and environment, educational outreach, and human services. You want to describe what kind of an impact you will have on the nonprofit partner. Because remember, these are not just projects that you do one time and you graduate. We want these projects to live in the community, to continue to serve the community. We also want to see how service learning connects to students and are the students impacted? What is the proposed budget? And I'll show you some numbers in a minute. And then finally, any project we do in engineering, remember the first three circles that I showed you, engineering, design, and innovation, you need to be able to measure what the success of your project is, right? Very easy to do, and you can apply any time. There are no deadlines. In other words, if you, at the end of the webinar today, you have a project, you can go to epics.ieee.org. It's only about two or three pages. Submit your project. Within 30 days, you'll get an answer, within 30 days, and you can start your project right away. So these resources are incredible, and I strongly encourage all of you to take advantage of them. So I'll briefly tell you about one project here. If you look at this project, it's a toy car. 
And uh, this student was actually uh, affected with uh, CP, cerebral palsy. So she does not have control over her movements, but yet she wants to play in the toy car. So what the students did is they used a pathfinder. So they uh, outfitted this car with sensors and it follows a predetermined path. Now the child still thinks she's driving the car and she has the experience of fun of playing with the car, but it is safe and she's able to go. This project is called uh, Go Baby Go. And this was done by Wichita State University. Again, these are free. Uh, you can take these resources. You can go to the Epic site and pull these up and use them in UNED if you want to connect with uh, students in your community to build a project. What has EPICS done? EPICS has given more than half million dollars in projects. And as you can see, about 60% of the projects are in Africa and Asia, right? Uh, Asia Pacific is about one third, 34%, 26% in Africa, only 6% in Europe. I'd really like to see this number go up. So I'm hoping that all of you on the call today are thinking about EPICS and IEEE projects because I'm sure there are opportunities in your community on how you can combine engineering with your inspiration to do something in a way to, right? So think about those projects and do submit those projects. Here's the other interesting thing about EPICS. More than one third of the students who participate in EPICS are women and 42% of the pre-university students uh, remember the, the the pyramid at the base of the pyramid you have students from the university and pre-university students almost 42 percent of them have been women pre-university students so please think about this uh, this is an opportunity that's available to all of you epics.ieee.org okay. the last one i'll talk about is ieee smart village right so ieee smart village uh, started about 10 years ago and it has projects again around the world and IEEE Smart Village, uh, the principle, again, is to look at uh, three pillars, electricity, education, and entrepreneurship. So everything begins with electricity. So in other words, if you're able to bring power, there is about 1.1 billion people around the world. Actually, this number is even higher today since the time this slide was created. I believe the number is close to 1.3 billion that do not have access to electricity. So if you can provide power, and then that opens up opportunities to build schools, to build healthcare centers, you bring entrepreneurs in. The goal of this project is to impact at least 50 million people by 2025, right? Remarkable project. And you can do this around the world. Again, there's a lot of projects in Africa and Asia, but I believe that there is an opportunity in other parts of the world as well for you to volunteer as, as a leader. So this one uh, incubates energy entrepreneurs. So they, most of them build renewable energy programs. Uh, and as a result of that, they're able to build schools, they're able to boost the local economy, but ultimately they advance IEEE's mission, advancing technology for humanity. And here are some of the global partners that they've done. Uh, this is a wonderful story. This was actually featured in National Geographic in the program called Breakthrough. Uh, it's up in the Himalayas it's in Lingashed, where a group of uh, IEEE volunteers and members got together and managed to build a DC microgrid to provide power there. There's no access to the grid, but they provided power to this village in Lingashed. So really wonderful, wonderful program. Power a village, empower a community. Okay. So as we get to the end of our talk, I want to focus on how you can get engaged and how you can volunteer and become successful through all of these opportunities. One of the words that I've not mentioned, which I think you've already probably guessed, is collaboration. Because none of these programs, none of these projects are done by one individual. They're done by groups of people who come together, who work together to work on things. Here's one example, the IEEE Learning Network, ILN.org. So today, in a virtual modality, if you want to learn some new technology, if you want to learn about uh, a new process, ILN brings together resources from all the technical societies in IEEE under one umbrella where you can access them. And considering the challenges that members around the world face, we've actually reduced the prices tremendously so that you can take a set of five courses uh, each for less than $10 and learn about a new technology. Maybe it's AI, maybe it's 5G, maybe it's IoT. Whatever it is you want to do, you can do this through ILN. Our Engineering Summer Institute is aimed at uh, young students. We bring them together to work on hands-on projects. 
That could be a challenge right now with COVID-19, but I'm sure we'll find a way to address the problem. Try Engineering Together is an e-mentoring program. So if you're on a student branch and you want to connect with your local community, uh, which is far away in a village and empower them, mentor them, you can do these things. And across IEEE, if you think about this wheel, whether it's publications, MGA, IEEE USA, educational activities, standards, technical activities, we're all working together collaboratively to ensure that you're successful, right? So let's talk about where you would go when you graduate from engineering. It is very clear when you look at the future that engineering is exciting. Engineers have contributed tremendously both to the communities in which they live, their countries, their colleagues, and their society. You know, the interesting thing is there are people, I studied electronics and communication engineering growing up. There are people who studied ECE with me who are now working in the financial industry. One of them is a cardiac surgeon who works at the Mayo Clinic. There are people who are working in business. So we've gone far and wide, but there is something about engineering, the analytical, the problem solving skills, working together as a team to solve a problem, uh, looking at inspirational needs, but always looking to make a difference in the world. I think that's what's unique about engineering. All of these other things, get to work on interesting projects, have a good work-life balance. We need to remind ourselves, right? Because we're doing webinars day in and day out. We have to remind ourselves that it's important for us to do this. Uh, get to work everywhere and travel. I'm not so sure about the travel anymore because I think it'll be a while before we start doing global travel. And you can certainly earn good money, have a very good living. So please do, again, think about your engineering career as an opening. You know, literally that's what we call commencement, graduation, because you're commencing your career. Engineering with inspiration equals innovation. So how can you do this? You're already halfway there, ladies and gentlemen. And if you're not, tell your friends to join the IEEE student branch. Check out the resources on tryengineering.org. All of these are free. Check out these resources. Volunteer. Volunteer to do something for your student branch. I told you I was a founding member of my student branch. I volunteered to create a newsletter called Bandwidth. Pretty interesting story. I still have copies of that. This is from 40 years ago. And one of the uh, students who was the associate editor of this newsletter, this is a student newsletter that we created 40 some years ago, 1978. Uh, he won the Alexander Graham Bell Award three years ago for communication engineering, uh, Professor um, uh, Seishadri Nambirajan. So you never know, right? So volunteer for leadership positions in your student branch, in your chapter, in your section. You can always get involved in programs. We talked about ethics. We talked about Ada Kappa New, humanitarian activities, smart village, site. I cannot emphasize this enough. Consider doing an internship because the more hands-on you get in the field, the better your engineering education is going to be. So as we come to the end of the talk here, I want to ask this question, and I think I know the answer. If I were to ask you, do you want to make a difference in the world? I think the answer to that is going to be absolutely yes. And one way for you to do that is by working with your community, working with young people like these. This is from the Tri Engineering Summer Institute. Or as you do in Region 8, uh, where you all come together. This was uh, a year ago uh, when we could still do face to face meetings. And I'm sure we can come back to do that again. But let's keep in mind the values that make this happen. IEEE is a platform that allows you to make this happen. And it does that because you are inclusive, you're collaborative, you are accountable, you're resilient, and you're ethical. This is what I tell someone when somebody asks me, Ramesh, why do you volunteer for IEEE? I say, I care because I'm inclusive, collaborative, accountable, resilient, and ethical. So ladies and gentlemen, it has been a real pleasure speaking with all of you. At this point, I think I will stop uh, sharing my screen and open it up for questions. That is my email address, s.ramesh at IEEE.org. Uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, the slides are there with Pedro and uh, Professor Castro. Again, my sincere thanks to all of you for attending this webinar. And I look forward to staying online for as long as you have questions. Uh, it is only uh, 10 o'clock and 50 here in California. So with that said, I'll turn it over back to Pedro. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramesh.
a real pleasure to, to hear you and, and to have you there. You have now connected a couple of friends too. You have connected now uh, El Mundo. El Mundo is there connected. And, <laughs> and you have to Oscar Martinez Bonastre, that is the, the chair of the IEEE Spanish section and is the chair too of the IEEE the Spanish chapter of the Education Society. He has the same two, the, two years, the, the two chairs in, in this case. He's a double chair, IEEE person there. That I'd like so to make one, one question. <laughs> yes, let me you one question there. The question is, the uh, major part of the people we have in the, in the United Student branch is a little bit different. We, are, we have not uh, freshman people there because our students has normally, they used to have from 30 to 60 years old. What should be the difference that you have in mind for this kind of people to be as a student, as a five IEEE members, to be all the life working in IEEE? What, what, what would be the recommendation for them in, in this case that they have a really a really different uh, age in these cases and they have they used to work, they used to have to go to the university, in this case in distance, and they have to do some volunteer time there too. So that's a great question. Thank you very much. You know, my personal experience, um, Manuel, is uh, the university that I work in is actually very similar to UNED uh, because we have students, the average age, if you look at the, uh, my college, I have 4,000 students in engineering. The average age in my college is about 24, the average age. So when you say the average is 24, you recognize there are people that are much higher than that. And we have freshmen who are 18. Now, what I find really interesting is when you get into situations like a lab, for example, I have students who have served in the armed forces. They've uh, been a veteran or they've had work. They started, for some reason, they dropped out of school, they raised a family, and now they decided to come back to study, right? So we put these students together in the lab and the teams are really, really interesting because I might see a freshman uh, in high school who's probably you know, younger than some of the children of the teammate that they have. So the, somebody on the team has children the age of their uh, partner. And they collaborate because the, the incoming freshmen in high school seem to know the new technologies very well, the smart technologies, smartphones, iPhones, and so forth. Whereas the hands-on experience that the people that have actually worked in industry how to work with scopes and logic analyzers, multimeters and all of that, they, they bring their hands-on experience there. So I just give that to you by way of example as to how we can integrate uh, students who, uh, you know, in, in our language, we call them, we used to call them non-traditional students. And I stopped doing that. And the reason is uh, my students taught me, they said, if you put the word non in front of it, that's a negative, right? So instead I said, I want to call them post traditional students. In other words, uh, anybody that is raising a family that is in their 40s, you know, one of my graduate students in Sacramento State, when he started the program, he was 41 when he started the program. So by the time he finished, he was already in his mid 40s, he got his master's, he's now teaching there. So I really think that's an opportunity. Now to the larger question of careers, I think the, the real world experience that uh, students like these bring are ones that IEEE needs to foster in our young professionals program. We need to be able to give them continuing education opportunities. We need to be able to give them opportunities to connect with their sections, maybe bring them in through programs like Smart Village and Epics and Ada Kappa New so that they can actually work on community projects. So I really view them as a very valuable component, a group of our team overall. Did I partially answer that question? Yes, yes, thank you very much. It's really, really interesting the answer because, for example, it's, it's really strange that you have a, a student older than you in a regular university. But we have, I have, I, I finished some years ago some students that was older than me. Yes. Every year, they are not so much because I'm going older. <laughs> but this yeah. is a different thing there. But this is the thing there, right? And they have a, a complete difference there. And for example, the people that, when I was, starting when we're starting to pushing in the IEEE at Eta Kappa Nu, I always believe that our university of course this, in our case we have some students that didn't do the, the the student during the regular time but other has two or three careers and we have people that have three masters two careers and they are finishing now a new master a new engineering there and they are really good students they have excellent students I have one student 10 years ago and he did only 
three subjects a year, but in every subject he has a plus. Yeah. Because he, he tried to get the most for every subject. And he spent the time he has really having, doing a, a really good job. And it's a different kind of a student, of course. Right. And, and, and we, we manage their teachers. So. Yes. Some more questions there? Have yes, some I have questions. Question. Okay. Yes. I have one. Can you feel me now or not? I don't know. I can see you too. <laughs> Hello, Ramis. It's a pleasure to, to see you again. Thank you, my friend. Uh, okay, um, I would like to, only to give you thanks for your presentation. For your, pre for your presentation has been very nice. Um, maybe to make a comment about uh, the process that Manuel and I are uh, following in order to create the Etacapa new chapters in our universities. So I have the opportunity to to talk with my students, that the students that have been selected for for these chapters. And I would like to know, to ask you about uh, what is your experience about about the feeling of, of, the, studi of the students that receive the services of the Etacapanu students. I know that uh, I, I, I've seen that there are very motivated students uh, uh, for uh, being part of this chapter, but uh, I am wondering about what is the, um, in your experience, what is the feeling of the students that receive this kind of services? Because I don't know if it can be any any kind of, of, um, of, uh, of problems because uh, uh, there are no part of this selected, of this elite, club, no? Uh, something like that is an elite, elite, uh, a, a top level. So the, uh, maybe there is a, in the, in the, in the current, in the, in the current society in general, in the world, I think that there, there is a message that everybody has to be equal to all the, all the rest, yeah. but it's not the same because uh, it's not the, uh, it's not a question because everybody has different motivation, different capabilities, and everybody has to to have the role in the society. It's not the same for us. Very so, true. Very true. Wonderful <laughs> question, Mondo. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, if you remember one on the slide, the very last but one slide when I talked about Ada Capenew, I said aspire to become an Ada Capenew member. And what I meant by that is there are different ways by which you can join any avenue, right? So the most common way is as a student, which is based on your academics and your scholarship and your attitude and so forth. But you also induct professional members into any avenue. In other words, let's say for some reason, uh, a student did not join uh, Ada Capenew when they were a student, for whatever reason, let's not even worry why, right? But years later, they've gone out, they've done really well in the world. Okay. You look at the transcript and you say, well, you're an average student, but that's okay. But they've done really, really well in the world. We've inducted them as professional members. So the point that I want to say is that, yes, Ada Capenew is an honor to be invited. But if you did not get invited when you were a student, it doesn't mean it is the end of the world. You can actually be invited at any point in your career to participate. My own experience, when I think about the students, we established, uh, I'm with the Lambda Beta chapter at, at my university, and we established it in 2008. In fact, I was inducted. I was inducted by the Lambda Beta chapter because as an undergraduate student, we didn't have Ada Capenew when I grew up in the 1970s. So the, my student chapter at the university, I was one of the first people inducted into my student chapter when I was dean of the College of Engineering and Computer Science. So. A lot of students who graduated, we have now had 12 years worth of this. So when you ask about what is the distinction, the one word that comes to my mind, uh, Edmundo and Manuel, is leadership, right? So all of these students have gone out, and it's not just because they were selected. In other words, you know, you're selected, you get a certificate, and you get a nice photo, and you put it up there. That is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what they did afterwards. So they've gone out, they started companies, many of them have started helping their fellow students, uh, many of them have gone to graduate school, some have gone to teaching, but the common thread in all of them is leadership. They all say, look, I'm very fortunate to have been selected for this. What can I do 
right? What can I do to be inclusive, to be collaborative, to be resilient, to be ethical, and to help my, my fellow students? So the I care message that I shared, that is what I hear from my students. When, when I talk to them, uh, I put a panel together probably uh, every semester for alumni to come and speak uh, to our students. The first people who put up their hand are Ada Capanew people, the first people. And they're all working, they're all busy. You know, some of them are even far away from California. And they'll say, Dr. Mesh, I can't come in person, but can I log in? Can you connect a Zoom session and so on? So I'd say when you start your chapter, uh, please encourage everyone that they can aspire to become a member. Uh, even though the qualifications may not be exactly right right now as a student member, they can always be inducted as a professional member and the society really exists to serve the community, right? Because all of us, you know, you and I, without our teachers, without our parents, we would not be here. So the same way Ada Kappanew members rely on each other, right? The leadership that Ada Kappanew provides is unique, in my opinion, because every single person who was inducted when you took that pledge, and I know both of you did, you said, I pledge, right, uh, that I will never slide along the path of least resistance. Remember that? <laughs> so you, you said that you would always be there and, and go the extra mile. So uh, don't be afraid. Yeah, don't be afraid. And uh, please uh, encourage people. It is not an exclusive club by any means. It is one that everyone should aspire to be a part of. And it's one that really cares about society. So I hope I hope that alleviates some of the concern. Thank you. Okay. Mateo, you have questions? You have to move? Okay, yes. So I'm a student, so I have the point of view of a student. So I wanted to ask you, like, how did you start and when did you fear, first hear about the about this great association? Because I started like one or one and a half or so uh, years ago, and I heard about the association from, from some friends who started the student branch in my university. So those were the ones who introduced me to the to this. So how did you start? That's my question. Yeah, great question, Mati. Thank you. And Mati, where are you in your program? Are you uh, graduating this year? Are you about to graduate soon? Uh, yes, I already graduated, but I'm also about to graduate soon because I'm doing a master's now in electronics. Wonderful, wonderful. So my story, Mati, is I started in 1978, right? So 1978, uh, I was in a five-year bachelor's degree program. Back then, engineering was five years because we learned things like thermodynamics and heat transfer and things outside of electrical engineering, even though I was a communications engineer. And uh, we heard about this organization called IEEE. We used to see uh, publications in the library. We used to get IEEE Spectrum. And a group of us in the uh, program uh, went to our professor, uh, who was not a member at that time, and asked uh, the professor, what can we do now, how do we get access to these publications? That's what started it, right? We wanted to get access to Spectrum because it looked like really interesting articles in Spectrum. So he said, well, you know, why don't you form a student branch? So uh, those days, again, without the internet, you know, we had to write to people and find out what IEEE was all about. And a few, a few months later, we got a letter from Piscataway that said, here is a form. Uh, please fill it out. You need to have at least eight students sign the form and then send it back to the Scataway, right? So I'm just sharing the story with you so you understand how things were back in 1978. So I was one of the founding members. So I signed the form, then I collected all the signatures from the others. My university was about 200 miles away from where the section office was, right? So, uh, and it still happened to be my hometown, so I took a train and they gave me the form to go give to the section chair. So I went to the section chair's office and he was a very busy man. He was signing some papers and I stood there with my form and he said, uh, yes, I said, sir, we want to form a student branch. And he took it, he looked at it, and then he went back to signing papers. And I said, sir, I said, yes. Um, well, I'll send it to Piscataway. You'll hear from them, <laughs> right? So I went back. And about two months later, the student branch was formed. So that's how we formed the branch. But we started that way. And literally, you know, this was the days before the internet, right? So I was telling you the story about our newsletter. So one of the things we said is, you know, wh what is it we need to do? Because our teachers are telling us to write lab reports and uh, technical reports and all these things. What is it we can do to improve our writing? So a group of us got together and said, you know, what if we create a newsletter, right? And they're all communications engineers. So we called our newsletter bandwidth. That's what we called it. 
And uh, I'm going to take you back to a time that you probably didn't even know existed because no internet, no photocopy machines. We don't even have Xerox machines, okay? What we had was this little thing called a cyclostyler, which is a drum with some ink on it. And we would type this up on a master, then you'd roll the master onto it and crank it. And as you cranked it, you would roll out sheets of paper. So we'd get it up, staple it, make 300 copies of the newsletter, and go and distribute them. Imagine where we are today, right? We're doing this webinar, uh, we're sharing PDFs, and you can go to ILN.org and download the articles just like that. Things have changed a lot, but IEEE, I think, really opened the door for those kinds of possibilities. So working together, you're probably going to laugh when you hear this, we had a competition called the Vincent Bendix Corporate Competition. So you could propose any project, like right now you'll probably say, I want to create a, a testing system to test for COVID-19, right? You might, you might submit a project like that. Back then, please don't laugh, we created a project which was a switch, a switch that you could turn on and off. That was a project. And we got $500 for the project. That was a big, big achievement. I, a great project. I love it. I'm going to propose that project later to my association. <laughs> <laughs> but at any cost. Yeah. So, so be motivated. You know, you're in graduate school right now. The last slide that I shared with you uh, is really important because if you go to tryengineering.org, you can look at all the opportunities that you have for research. And again, Matthew, just remember this is the beginning, right? Because you're just starting out in your career. There's so much more that you're going to do. You're going to become an IEEE fellow. You're going to be on the IEEE board of directors. You are going to serve humanity. That is the way you want to look at IEEE as you go forward. Okay, that was like a great answer. I wasn't expected, expecting such a great answer, so thank you. And please, uh, I already wrote that before, uh, but can you share all the links later by email or LinkedIn or something? Yeah. Pedro will put the, the video there to all the people and, and you can take it. In. Well, put it in. Thank you very much, Mateo. Okay. Yeah. Mateo, we have the slides too. You can even share the slides. And if you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, I'm happy to share any additional information. So that's amazing. Okay. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some more, some more questions there. No more questions. People, I believe, is, is okay there. Thank you very much again, Rames. A real pleasure to have you here today. You are the first one. We, we started for the first time in, in our student branch an English uh, section of the webinars. We have in the in the last two months, we have around 20 webinars, around 20 webinars, and it was really well attended there too for, for any kind of things for the, for the students and for the people. But this is the first one of the new English area. We'll have the next one will be the, the, the Women in Engineering Representative Lisa uh, Asunta that will be there in, in a couple of weeks. And we started this new webinar in English too for the Spain because we need to improve our English. And it's one of the things that we have for, with our students too. Thank you very much and a real pleasure. I hope to see you not so so far, far away. I hope so too. <laughs> we will, we will, I will see you in, in June, but I will not see you in June in the, in the tab and in the board of directors and probably in November there will be open things there, but I, I wish you the, the best things there in, in California. Thank Say you. hello to all of our friends there, Kathleen and so on. And thank you very much. And you like to say something more, Pedro? It's your turn. Thanks, Manuel. And thanks a lot, Ramos, for your presentation. It, it was great, <laughs> impressive. And uh, we have uh, take some some ideas to to, to use from your presentation, uh, such as Epic site, uh, Try Engineering. We, we try to, to move in these areas because it sounds great. Yes, today, today in the in the IT Project Region 8, they sent an email about the, the 14 best projects of Epic that was selected just oh, yeah. last week. And they sent today the email there. They, they are starting out of new projects in Region 8 because Region 8 is one of the region mainly Europe, because Africa is going OK and Middle East, but Europe is starting slowly, but we have to improve it. We did, I remind, probably 12 or 14 years ago, we did one of the best of, of the first IEEE Foundations projects in Spain. 
Oh, we did it in the student branch. We for three years we have one project of the AEEE Foundation, and it was one of the first we had in, in Europe for this time, 20 or 14 years ago. But we will try, of course. It's a good idea to to do it as much as things we do, as much as we are alive. Wonderful. Well, I, I, I want to say again, you know, a big thank you to you, Manuel, for your hospitality, to Pedro uh, for signing in early, Edmundo for being on the call. Uh, Matteo, for your question, that was a very good question. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. You mentioned the fact that your students are interested in improving their English. On ILN, we have English for Engineers, which is another program that is available. Uh, that, I think, will be a great resource for your students. Uh, and I know if they're students, we can find ways to make it available to them for not a very high cost, uh, make it relatively inexpensive for them. Uh, the idea, again, IEEE is a global organization. We really want to support our students, our young professionals, educators, industry No matter where you are in the world, we want you to think about IEEE as your home, right? Not just today, not just tomorrow, but into the future, as you're going into the future. So please keep that in mind. I think. That would probably had a few more slides at the end, right? He was going to share some slides, I think. Yes. But I just want to thank you. You know, in a post-COVID world, I don't think we'll be shaking hands anytime. But this is how we say thank you in India, where I'm from originally, right? <laughs> Namaste. So keep your hands together, wash them, of course. You know, make sure. <laughs> but be well, be safe, be healthy, everybody. And thank you very much for the opportunity. It's been a wonderful pleasure speaking with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ramesh. Thank you very much, then. And take care and bye bye to all the people there. We'll continue this week and the next week and the next week with new webinars there. Stay connected. Yeah. Stay connected. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Namaste. Ciao, ciao. Bye bye there. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.